Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Very glad you're with us for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We have good in a weird way, a bad and a crazy martini for conservatives today. Grab your stool. Lots to talk about today. And, of course, if you have vivid memories of the 2020 presidential election, chances are you remember that in mid to late October, the New York Post broke a story that Hunter Biden dropped his laptop off at a computer repair shop in Delaware, never went back for it. And lo and behold, there was lots of interesting stuff on there about business dealings, particularly overseas and 10% for the big guy, Tony Bobolinsky. Hopefully this is all ringing a bell. But we were told over and over, Jim, this is unverified. This is reckless reporting. Twitter censored uh, the uh, the New York Post account on Twitter. Any posts related to it were taken down on Twitter and probably elsewhere. Also, Joe Biden on the debate stage called it Russian disinformation. I found a Politico story that somebody else had tweeted out today that had been uh, tweeted out at the time by Jen Psaki that this was Russian disinformation. It wasn't Russian disinformation. And now the New York Times is admitting this. And the New York Post, in its own <laughs> unique style, uh, is a bit incredulous as to how the world is just going to accept this and move on like nothing happened before. The New York Post says, forgive the profanity, but you've got to be blanking us. First, the New York Times decides more than a year later that Hunter Biden's business woes are worthy of a story. Then deep in the piece, in passing, it notes that Hunter's laptop is legitimate. Quote, people familiar with the investigation said prosecutors had examined emails between Mr. Biden, Mr. Archer, and others about Burisma and other foreign business activity, the Times writes. Those emails were obtained by the New York Times from a cache of files that appears to have come from a laptop abandoned by Mr. Biden in a Delaware repair shop. The email and others in the cache were authenticated by people familiar with them and the investigation. So the word appears probably isn't necessary in that paragraph, is it? So, uh, Jim, vindication for the Post, vindication for uh, people who blasted Twitter and everybody else for censoring a pretty critical story just two weeks before Election Day. What do we what do we make of this? Well, I can understand why some people are arguing that it's not a good martini, but anyone, anytime the New York Times and every other major media institution except the New York Post end up with egg on their faces, it is a good day. I think you know, a lot of good competition <laughs> for this. I'd forgotten about Biden saying it from the stage. Um, but I think one just jumps out is the uh, Terrence Samuels, the National Public Radio Managing Editor for News, who said, we don't want to waste our time on stories that are not really stories. And we don't want to waste the listeners and readers' time on stories that are just pure distractions. That was his assessment back in October 2020. There are multiple aspects here. The first is like what was on that laptop was pretty shocking. And I can understand somebody saying, oh my God, really? Could he, could he really be doing this? 10% for the big guy, stuff like that. Could it really be that glaring? But, you know, back in, I want to say late 2019 or so, I did this huge, you know, timeline of basically every time Hunter Biden's name had ended up in the news, going back for like two decades. And generally almost all of it involved um deals that at minimum would make you say hmm, right people you know hunter biden's first real job was to be a lobbyist i mean he insisted he never lobbied his dad but having said that if you call up and you say hey i'm hunter biden uh, there's a really good chance that a democratic senator is going to recognize oh you're joe biden's son okay what do you need and he lobbied on behalf of several people um one deal after another with people who pretty clearly were you know there's no circumstance in which hunter biden would have ended up um, being selected and, and getting these kinds of deals if his last name was Smith and he was not known as the son of a prominent Democratic senator, then a Democratic presidential candidate, and then de the Democratic vice president of the country. And there were stories back then that didn't get a huge amount of attention, but you know that, that when he was joined the Burisma board and the State Department said, we have no uh we have no nothing to say on that and the white house said oh we've got nothing to say on that like other people could see this was a glaring conflict of interest everybody could see this was uh the sort of thing it's a sort of situation that was going to call every u.s policy regarding ukraine into question and it sounds like people in the obama administration would periodically try to bring up this issue to biden 
Joe Biden, I mean, and Joe Biden would just kind of get very defensive about it, get angry. And, you know, you know, how can you say that about my child? And all that. And it was just too touchy a subject for somebody to say, look, you're the vice president of the United States. Your son cannot serve on the boards of foreign corporations. He cannot take go- jobs that are paying, you know, five figures a month. It just looks bad. It it stinks to high heaven. It looks like corruption. Mr. Vice President, your son can't do this. You have to tell him he can't do this. Being in this position in government is a privilege. And he is, you know, that requires certain sacrifices. The sacrifice is you can't take lucrative little or no work jobs for foreign corporations. But anyway, so if you knew all that, the idea of this stuff on on the laptop didn't seem quite so shocking. Right. They're basically, Hunter Biden, in addition to having, unfortunately, a, a serious drug problem and a for, in addition to having all kinds of relationship problems and everything else, uh, Hunter Biden had one skill that was be, have, having that last name. And he, you know, he had one good way of making money, which was get you know, people who wanted to be close to his father were willing to give him lots of money in order to be close to his father. We saw the same thing after Biden became president with these ludicrous art sales. Oh, all of a sudden, Hunter Biden is the most in demand artist in the world. Right. So all of this is ridiculous and egregious. And this is why Twitter and all the other social media networks that basically say, oh, this, we're not letting this go. You can't read this New York Post story. We're not allowing you to share it. It's too dangerous. It's too bad. Well, it turned out to be the truth. So uh, this is why these social media companies should not be in the business of deciding this news is not appropriate. I know, oh, by the way, I think it was like 50 uh, so-called intelligence experts and, and folks like that who issued a statement saying that this story, quote, I believe, I believe the wording was something like, has all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. Well, look, either you know it's Russian disinformation or you don't. And if you don't know that it's Russian disinformation, you don't get to get this out of the news cycle because you just plain don't like it. That is what happened here, and it is an outrage, and it is good that all of these institutions are you know, embarrassed. It is very revealing, I think, that the New York Times did bury that fact fairly low in the story, though. Did anybody learn anything from this? That's the question. Will we have this same pattern play out the next time we're two weeks from an election and uh, the candidate the mainstream media likes has some some bad reports happening or are we actually going to get a free flow of information that next time i doubt that you're going to see that much change behavior but now people can point out yeah remember they told you the hunter Biden's laptop was false wow and you know one one more example to throw on the pile of an official there also remember you shouldn't wear a mask <laughs> And the lab leaks conspiracy theory and uh, yeah, a million other examples people can think of. It's always there's never like a big reveal or a big mea culpa or anything. It's just kind of slipping it into paragraph 14 of a story or or some report of this thing. We uh, insisted that nobody was allowed to say publicly. Yeah, it's kind of true. Just Just the way it operates. Just maddening. Not the way it should work in a free society. That's for sure. But you know what does work well in a free society? Getting meat delivered to your front door. That's really, really good. And that's where Moinkbox comes in. Man, their bacon is fantastic. My favorite bacon anywhere. But 60%, I don't know if you knew this, 60% of U.S. pork production comes from one company that's actually owned by the Chinese. And their hogs are given what's called ractopamine, which is banned in 160 countries Oddly enough, including China. But you can find it in your grocery aisle every day because it's allowed here. But there's a better way to get quality meat. And that's where Moink Box comes in. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did. And as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should because the family farm does it better. The Moink difference is a difference you can taste. And you can feel good knowing that you're helping family farms stay financially independent, too. Now, you choose the meat delivered in every box, from ribeyes to chicken breasts to pork chops to salmon fillets and much more. And you can cancel any time. Look, Jim and I have both had the chance to enjoy the Moink box, from the steaks to the chicken to the pork to the bacon, in case I haven't made that point strongly enough, to the salmon high-quality uh, meat all the way around. The fish is fantastic, too. Uh, you will not regret getting the Moink Box or giving it as a gift. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com martini right now. And listeners of the 3 Martini Lunch will get free filet mignon for a year. 
That's right. That's one year of the best filet mignon you'll ever taste, but it's only for a limited time. It's spelled M-O-I-N-K box dot com slash martini. That's moinkbox dot com slash martini. All right, Jim, on to our official bad martini now. And uh, news organizations and big tech can certainly uh, think of the last martini as a bad one in respect to them as well. But this one uh, is focusing on your morning jolt today. And you devoted the entire morning jolt uh, to what you've noticed, not only over the Russia-Ukraine crisis, but over the COVID crisis, over the Olympics in China fiasco, and so much more. And basically, it's that international organizations, while they, uh, you know, they like getting together, they like putting things on paper, they like uh, making speeches and stuff, they're not actually good at getting stuff done. Um, the the handling of the pandemic was obviously a disaster from the WHO. They took their marching orders from China and did whatever Beijing wanted them to do. The IOC kowtowed to China all the way along. And now the UN, whether it's the UN Security Council, which obviously Russia's on so they can veto anything they want, or when it comes to human rights, which are being violated left and right by the Russians in Ukraine, uh, the UN pretty much powerless to do absolutely anything. So, Jim, what are they good for? <laughs> That's the old song. What is war? What is it good for? Huh, absolutely nothing. Um, the United Nations is throws apparently some really good conferences. Uh, really good cocktail parties, I guess would be the easy joke here and, and things like that. Look, they all say that they care. And I don't doubt that everybody at the United Nations would like to stop Russia from invading Ukraine. It's just that when push came to shove, nothing could be done. The United Nations does not have any army of its own. It has peacekeepers. Those peacekeepers really have a terrible uh, track record when it comes to actually preserving or being able to enforce any type of peace. In fact, the uh, uh, abuses and, and you know allegations of wrongdoing are rife and, and just jaw-droppingly appalling. Um, I think some of this may come back to, you know, memories of the Bush days and the argument that the U.N. had all these, uh, uh, you know, the no-fly zone and all these other things that they were attempting to uh, restrict on Iraq. And Saddam Hussein was breaking those U.N. edicts left and right. And that no matter how many, you know, the U.N. would just you know, issue a resolution and nothing would happen. Or they'd say, send Han, Hans Blix, Hans Bricks, as I'm thinking <laughs> of that uh, scene from uh, Team America. It seemed impotent. It seemed that it would, would just enact how things all, it would say this is well, we don't you shouldn't be able to do this, Saddam was saying, and then nothing would happen, and the UN would just kind of shrug and be okay with it. And the UN didn't mind being impotent. And then of course the United States came along and said, Well, we're gonna actually enforce this, and we will, you know, we're willing to go to war with over this, and the Iraq war began. Um, the UN seemed comfortable with saying bad regimes should not do these things, denouncing them on paper. And then watching nothing happen, and I think this—we've seen it now. Uh, how you know they, they will issue one denunciation of Israel after another, but they do nothing on North Korea. They do nothing on all these other you know terrible human rights abuses. It is an absolute struggle to get the Russians and Chinese to go along with any of us on the uh, UN Human Rights Council against other countries. And for obvious, obviously, Russia is never going to denounce itself at the UN, and China is very rarely going to denounce any other country because they want to preserve their. Their attitude is no country should ever interfere in other countries' inter internal affairs. Um, so in the end, I, I think that the argument going back to the Bush days or even earlier about, oh, these bad unilateralist Americans and these cowboys are all, you know, why aren't we listening to the world community? Well, the world community is perfectly comfortable to sit back and just watch terrible things happen so, yeah, to the extent that there is a world community. There is no, you know, the, the UN is a debating society. It just runs up parking tickets. It doesn't do anything. Um, and as you noted, you know, this, this pattern uh, the UN is powerless against Russia. The World Health Organization can't get another team into China to investigate the origins of COVID-19. For the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, they just repeated whatever China was telling it, even though apparently the subsequent reporting revealed that people at the World Health Organization strongly suspected what China was telling them didn't make sense. It did not make sense to have all these cases increasing if it was not capable of human to human transmission, but they, they couldn't verify it themselves. So they just their job was to just repeat what the local health authorities were telling them. Um, we just saw the disaster with the Olympics. I mean, you, and apparently in Interpol, look, we think of Interpol, you see it a whole bunch of movies, you know, you're thinking it's chasing jewel thieves, right? It's chasing uh, all these, you know, you know, terrible criminals, drug cartels, stuff like that. Now, Interpol more and more is getting its, its system clogged, so to speak, with red notices against uh, human rights activists and dissidents and political opponents of regimes of China and Russia and Iran and places like that. 
All these big in international institutions, they don't do their job. So this is not me wanting to be a unilateralist cowboy. I'd love to live in a world where big international institutions were capable of solving big problems, but they're not. They haven't been able to doing it for a long, long time. So if we in the United States want to make a better world, we got to try, we got to at least be open to trying something different instead of just saying, oh, well, the problem is we're just not giving enough money to the United Nations or, oh, you know. No, nope, no. Nope. The problem is, is that they've not figured out how to stand up for themselves and they've allowed themselves to get co-opted by the Chinas and Russians of the world. So uh, it is deeply bad news. and I think it's vivid. I think there are enough you know, folks on the, in the Democratic Party who are now starting to recognize, OK, the U.N. is not the institution it used to be. I think, unfortunately, clearly they're not ready to break from it and get into the hard work of creating some sort of successor organization. Uh, that would, you know, represent only democracies and not be paralyzed because uh, a certain portion of its members are, you know, the ones who are perpetrating some of the greatest crimes going on on Earth right now. No, that's exactly right. And uh, that's a tall order trying to get the uh, the, the freedom loving nations uh, around the world to band together on these sorts of things, because right now the U.N.'s job is basically to give, you know, tyrants and dictators a forum in the United States to bash the United States and to wrap Israel on the knuckles. And of course, the most outrageous thing that we see every year from the UN is who makes it onto the Human Rights Council. Right now, China's on there, you know, committing genocide. But yeah, put them on the on the Human Rights Commission. Cuba, always nice to their citizens. Uh, Pakistan, Russia's on there right now, too, along with Ukraine. So I'm sure they're getting along well uh, and, and, and so forth. So, I mean, I mean, some of the world's worst actors. I know the when there was a, the Darfur crisis, I think Sudan was on there. I, mean, I don't know if it's just a pick a ping pong ball out of a drum like at the old NBA lottery or, or what happens there. But uh, the U.N.'s becoming uh, a parody of itself and has been for a while, unfortunately. All right. Let's talk about something way better than that. And that is the phenomenal products you can get from my pillow. The pillows themselves, the sheets, the towels, the slippers. Very much high quality products all the way around. And today we're focusing on the high quality six piece My Pillow towel set, which are regularly $109.99, but now just $39.99 a set. The My Pillow six piece towel set is made with cotton grown right here in the United States. Now, other towels might feel good, but they don't absorb, or maybe they absorb, but they don't feel good. Well, every My Pillow towel is made from proprietary technology that makes them highly absorbent and soft to the touch. There's none of that lotion-y feel. Every set comes with two bath towels, two hand towels, and two washcloths. They're available in a variety of colors and sizes. They're machine washable, and they come with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a one-year limited warranty. Right now, for a limited time, you can get the MyPillow six-piece towel set, regularly $109.99, for only $39.99 with the promo code MARTINI. Visit MyPillow.com slash martini or call 800-874-0104. You'll also find deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the MyPillow mattress topper, MyPillow Giza Dream Sheets, and so much more. Get your six-piece MyPillow towel set for only $39.99 today at MyPillow.com slash martini or when you call 800-874-0104. MyPillow.com slash martini. All right, Jim, we talked about it earlier in the week, and that is... The really odd juxtaposition of the United States clearly uh, being on the side of Ukraine and its war against Russia just sent a lot more in weapons. I think $800 million worth in uh, weapons over to Ukraine, the economic sanctions against Russia, the whole nine yards. At the same time, the U.S. is outsourcing negotiating this new debacle of an Iran nuclear deal to the Russians and the Chinese. So the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians are going to decide what our position is going to be with respect to Iran's nuclear program. But it doesn't stop there. Daily Wire also reporting that as these negotiations continue, President Biden's administration is reportedly considering lifting the foreign terrorist organization designation on Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in exchange for a public commitment from Iran that they will play nice in the region. Russian diplomat Mikhail Ulyanov praised Iranian negotiators earlier this month, saying that Iran got much more than it could expect. Quote, an agreement to restore the 2015 nuclear deal is nearly complete, but Iran's demand that President Biden reverse Donald Trump's decision to designate the IRGC as a foreign terrorist organization is a key remaining sticking point. So 
Jim, it's not enough that the Iranians and the Russians are going to see sanctions easing at the worst possible time uh, from our perspective for both of them. Uh, but now the IRGC, which clearly is a terrorist organization, might get off the hook, too. You know, out of all the stances of the old Obama administration, and clearly I think the the objective of the Biden administration regarding the Iran deal is to never admit that the old Obama administration was wrong about the Iran deal. This was always a, you know, I would say a Hail Mary pass of diplomacy, but I think it really was, uh, you know, sometimes people catch Hail Mary passes. <laughs> um, the, the idea was that, well, somehow we extend a hand of friendship to the Iranians. Oh, by the way, you know, we had put uh, all kinds of screws to them and we'd actually started to hurt their economy. And it looked like they were getting ready to, uh, you know, that they might be persuaded to realize you could either have a healthy functioning economy with decent amounts of employment, you know, people, your people happy, your people thriving, or you could have a nuclear program and a nuclear weapons program. One or the other. You can't have both. And the U.S. was putting the squeeze on it year by year. And the Iranian economy really was getting hammered by it. And it was, oh, okay, maybe we do. And then the Obama administration comes along and says, look, we have this completely different approach. In the end, we think we can be friends. An unbelievably naive approach, right? That we, we know that you chant death to Jews, death to America, death to the great state. We know things have been bad since 1979. But we're willing to turn over a new leaf. We're willing to wipe the slate clean. We will give you, not only will we relieve the sanctions, we'll give you all, we'll send you cash on pallets. All we ask for you is a promise that you're not going to develop a nuclear weapon. And in fact, we're not even going to ask you to not develop a nuclear weapon ever. We're going to ask that you not develop a nuclear weapon for the next, what was it at the time, like 13 years or something like that? It was, it was you know, a decade and change. And oh, by the way, our enforcement of it, like we're not going to inspect your military facilities. We're not going to inspect, you know, we, you give us a list of places we're allowed to inspect and we'll go along with that and everything will be fine. And unsurprisingly, you know, like this, this was never particularly likely to work. The only upside is that maybe in that 13 year stance, you had a chance of some sort of uh, uprising in Iran. There, there had been one very early in Obama's years. You knew that there was a, but obviously the likelihood of an uprising against the Iranian government was increased with economic pr pressure. If economic pressure alleviates and then people are thriving, they're much less likely to be upset with the government. So this deal was almost all downside. But I think Barack Obama convinced that he looked different because every all these other uh, presidents and he had a different approach and that he would be his middle name was Hussein. He would be able to you know connect with the Iranian leadership in a way that no other American president could. So he sent John Kerry and John Kerry negotiated in Geneva for week after week, month after month. And then we ended up with this. And everybody you know, who looked at this deal said, there's no way this is enforceable. This is not going to work. And on paper, you're like, well, OK, well, you know, the Senate would reject it. But then. It was not a treaty, and never, you know, thus it didn't need to be sent to the uh, to the Senate for ratification. The Senate had a vote anyway. The Senate rejected it, but the idea was, oh, you know, because it's not officially a treaty, it's just a memorandum of understanding. We can, you know, we can go ahead with this. Trump gets into office. Trump blows it up. Uh, you know, most of us looked at it and say, look, this was never, this was never a good idea. This was never going to work. Don't blame Trump for this going wrong. And now Biden's back, and Biden is desperate to make it come back. De he's desperate to resurrect it. Because Biden is convinced somehow, look, in some way we can get to the Iranians to the table. They're reasonable, we swear. But what's even more baffling is that now we're relying on the Russians to be the impartial negotiator helping hammer out the deal. There's no way this works out well and is an indication that the Biden administration has its priorities just completely backwards and cannot see anything clearly because they are so wedded to assumptions they made early, you know, back in like 2009, 2010. It is an absolute nightmare for U.S. foreign policy. We'll see if it, shake, it shakes out. I keep thinking this is such an unworkable idea uh, that eventually, you know, that, that they'll have to drop it. But I guess in the end, this is not a lot different from the Obama years, where really nobody outside the Obama administration was all that persuaded this was going to work. And yet, uh, you know, it, it carried on until Trump was in office. It's unbelievable. I mean, as far as I can tell, John Kerry gave the Iranians everything they wanted anyway, so maybe it doesn't do any good to have an American in the room. It's just going to be a disastrous deal. Why we're pursuing it, I have no idea. But, Jim, when you think about Barack Obama, of course, this is one of the blights on his foreign policy record. Another one, of course, was not doing much of anything when the Russians went into uh, Crimea and then eventually into the eastern part of Ukraine, or at least, uh, you know, 
their aligned rebels uh, help them out in eastern Ukraine. I haven't heard much from Barack Obama other than that he's got COVID the last few weeks here. It's been pretty quiet given the uh, foreign policy setup he's given the last couple of administrations. I lost, lost my voice. Right, <laughs> lost my voice. Uh, look, I, I think it's very clear that uh, our administration has made very clear to Russia there are consequences for invading Crimea. So it's all done. So what are the odds of, of actually you can tell I'm shifting from Obama into Shatner. What are the odds? <laughs> uh, Shatner would have a tougher line. They, those Klingons, they killed my son. Um, the the, the you know, Obama's attitude is, well, we're going to enact some economic sanctions. And that, you know, really it's Europe's problem to solve. Yeah, that always we we always count on Europe to solve their own problems, and that that they always do, don't they? We never have to rush in to save them. That never that never goes wrong. Yeah, that's where we are. That you know, in the end, I don't think the weak Western response to the invasion of Crimea. It's not the only reason that uh, Russia invaded the rest of Ukraine, but it's a big contributing factor. And if there had been a stronger Western response. It is hard to believe that history would have shaken out exactly the way it has. Uh, there would have been at least some stronger, would have given more of uh, uh, more reason for Vladimir Putin to think twice before he went ahead with this. Jim, I've spent the last 60 seconds imagining Captain Kirk being president of the United States, which I think would be an upgrade over Obama and Biden. The problem, of course, is that with Starfleet Command, he's not only a globalist, he's like a galactist. And so that could be a problem. <laughs> well, you know, he can have the president of Earth, uh, Stacey Abrams. <laughs> For those who missed it, apparently she had a cameo in one of the more recent Star Trek series. It's only on Paramount Plus, playing the president of Earth in the far future. Um, so that's that's how that shook out. Um, the future look the future does not look great in America. <laughs> but this, I might just say, I don't know whether she actually won the presidency of Earth or whether she just came in second by fifty thousand votes and runs around <laughs> insisting she still is the president of Earth. It's it's wild. Anyway. Anytime you get a Shatner reference, and it's a good show. Jim, uh, have a great day. We'll see you again tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Tell a friend about us as well. Very grateful for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a terrific Thursday, and please join us on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit DanaRadio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.